I am Dagmar Keim. I work for the city of Amsterdam, which is on the top. And I'm originally German and I come from Aachen, which is uh, in the middle of the Shore Euro Delta. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I experience the Shore Euro Delta every day. And I am very excited that you're all here to think about how cross border cooperation on that scale can help to enhance our own goals as our cities, as regions, but also to reach the goals of Europe. Dagmar, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. The whole time you didn't hear me? No, 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 just last 10 seconds. Yeah, okay. I don't know why that happened. Um, I will share my screen about what we are doing today. Okay, you can see it. Yes, not well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, today we are having the third day of the lunch forums. Um, the first forum was on Monday. For maybe I hope most people of you joined at that meeting. Uh, we talked about a couple of themes that we are working together on. It with the Shure Euro Delta. Um, the first theme was water management and climate adaptation. We had a lot of inspiring speakers talking about it. The second day, we talked about uh, cross-border mobility and infrastructure. And also there, we had a lot of interesting uh, speakers. These are two themes that I think a lot of work has been done already, and where there are many organizations working on, that, on that, these themes. Today, we start exploring a little bit a new theme, actually the smart specialization strategies. The smart specialization strategies is something that we are used to do on regional level, but on a scale of Euro data, it is quite unexplored. And we are getting here also into a new field and which is also very interesting. That makes it, I think, even more interesting. Because like we showed on the first day in the movie that we, we showed you, um, we are trying to enhance the, the targets of, the, of our own regions but also to contribute to reaching the goals from the European Commission, the new European Green Deal. And one of the ambitions is to become circular. So I'm very happy that with this theme, we are trying to contribute to make our regions and the region of the Euro Delta more circular. Um, we will have a lot of inspiring speakers today that will show us what could be smart specialization, and how could that contribute to the making Europe more circular? Okay, um, on the side of this lunch forum today, we always have an open office day. And today it is the Metropole Ruhr business. Dimitri, maybe you want to say hello if you are there at the group. Yes, of course, Dagmar. Hi, Dagmar. Hi, everyone. It's, I'm very happy to say hello to you. And uh, glad to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Glad to yeah. join you in this lunch and, forum. And you are there with a couple of people, right? How yes, many people and are there? I will uh, be uh, just free to show you who is here also with us. We have some guests from the Netherlands, uh, and also my colleague, Rebecca, who are joining us for the session. So hi, everyone. Thank you. All right, um, then today we, you're gonna talk about uh, the case of the business Metropole Ruhr. Afterwards, we will have a Dutch speaker, Van Daniel de Klein, who is business development manager, urban development initiative in Eindhoven, and Ernst von Seile, senior advisor of Sweco. If you look at the program that we're having today, well, first of all, I have this short welcome. Um, and then you, Dimitri, will talk about from coal to renewables, transforming the Euro, or a metropolis um, of the metropole Ruhr, which is actually a smart specialization strategy that you did. After that, Daniel, you will talk about digital cities. And then Ernst, you're going to talk about asset management, tooling, and material passports. I hope that all these cases help us to think about what could smart specialization be and how could that help us to contribute to become a more circular uh, Eurodata. So I'm looking forward to that discussion and debate. 
Um, we have a lot of experts here and I hope they will help me answering the questions and most of all you're talking to each other, trying to solve the different questions. Um, and I really would like to stop at 1.30, so I would like the speakers. You're, you're on mute again, Dagmar. Yeah, I don't know why that happens, because I'm not touching anything. We'll tell you. Okay. All right. Okay, let's uh, start. Dimitri, can I give you the word? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dagmar. And uh, I will... Maybe actually I can ask you to, uh, Alan Krita, uh, to open the slides because, because uh, we have some, indeed, some problems here with their. Um, sure, with the I can share my screen. Shall I do that? Yes, please. Yes, I think it will be safer. Okay. We have some technical problems here. Slide. I hope you still can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we, can, we we cannot see the screen yet. No. 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 Oh, no. you can see. Okay, it's, then it's my. Uh, uh, so my uh, yes, please. It's, uh, okay. We have to be a bit flexible here. Yes. Uh, I. I hope then you you can see here or here. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So okay. Uh, Hello again uh, from here, from the city of Essen, from the heart of the rural metropolis, a uh, region in the very west of Germany. And um, well, uh, I will not, we don't have so much time, so I will not give a very detailed introduction to uh, our region, the rural metropolis. Uh, but I guess most of you know it, maybe even quite well. And of course, we can uh, get back to uh, to it also later uh, during um, during the the discussion. So um, today, uh, just maybe one short uh, important notice. I will not be presenting to you our smart specialization strategy because it is still being developed. Or well, actually, to be honest, it's finalized, but it's not public yet. So we can talk about it later, of course, during, during the discussion, but I cannot still uh, show you slides and figures. Uh, but at a later stage, I will be very glad to do that. But I will present you a project which is st still very much related to what we are doing in terms of smart specialization as uh, the Rural Metropolis. And uh, concretely, I will talk about the so-called Five Aerials program and how it helps uh, to transform the Rural Metropolis in uh, currently and in the next years. Uh, so uh, if we go to the, to the next slide, then just uh, some uh, very briefly, some important figures uh, to, to understand a bit better the context, uh, what we're talking about. Uh, if we look, take a look here at uh, the sources of the gross electricity generation by energy in Germany, we, of course, we see that uh, the share of uh, renewables has uh, significantly increased over, let's say, last 10 to 15 years. It is in green, and uh, the darker gray is the share of hard coal, which has significantly decreased and is, is, is decreasing, um, actually, even in the last couple of years, maybe five years or something. Uh, um, so uh, just uh, keep it in mind for the, con for, for the context of what we're talking about. The next slide, please. Uh, now, you, when we talk about the rural region or the rural metropolis, as we officially call it here, uh, uh, then we uh, can see that uh, this region that uh, has a very important, uh, huge industrial past, past in, in, in heavy industries, in manufacturing industries, has uh, over years and over decades has become uh, a, a region uh, which is uh, where, where the service sector mainly dominates. Of course, uh, this is something that re that refers to many regions in Europe and all and all over the world. But uh, for our region, it has a very special meaning, as you will see, and we will also refer to it later. And another important uh, number. 
uh, or uh, statistics in the next slide, uh, please, is uh, uh, coming from this heavy industrial past, uh, we used to have uh, 500,000 employees in the mining sector by uh, the end of uh, the 50s, by 1960, more or less. Then a huge decline began, which enormously affected our economy. And at the same time, we had not a single student until the beginning of the 60s in the region. They were just for a simple fact that there were no universities here. High, there was no higher education in the rural region. There was no entrepreneurship. There was just actually industry, manufacturing industry, coal mining, and some other things that we'll see now. So um, if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that uh, what coal means or what it has meant for our region uh, in the historical perspective, uh, uh, the, the number of employees and how it has significantly decreased over years. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, sorry, uh, just uh, let's uh, stay here for a second. Uh, uh, 19th century, large scale coal mining and very important downstream sectors, iron, electricity industry, and of course, steel. Steel is still important for our region, but not as much as it used to be. Uh, there, there was a very high population increase, uh, becoming the rural metropolis becoming one of the biggest. Um, regions, metropolitan regions in Europe. And the last hard coal mine was, uh, the last coal, hard coal was mined in the rural metropolis uh, four years ago in 2018. So now coal is imported and used for coal fired power generation, which directly leads us, us to the next topic and the next slide. Uh, as you maybe have heard, in Germany, uh, there is a law that uh, will uh, lead to the closure of uh, all uh, coal-fired power plants until 2038. There is a huge political debate about this, and this debate was really big last year during the electoral uh, campaign um, uh, for the for the parliament elections, because of course the Green Party would. Uh, uh, like to accelerate this process. So this is currently, this is the law until 2038. Uh, there is a, gr a gradual phase out of uh, coal fired power, which is taking place. And for our region, that concretely means that, uh, um, so this is a bit more comfortable, um, uh, that uh, now we're, or let's say in 2020, we had still six, power plants actively running and uh, I th and five of them are still running now and uh, two are planned to be closed this year. So this is still a, a very important issue for our region. You can see here on the map of the rural metropolis, the five, uh, hello, more participants are coming here to our open office day. So hi everyone. Uh, so, um, you can see the five locations. We call them officially in English the five aerials. That's why the, na the name five aerials program, Duisburg, Gelsenkirchen, Ham, Herne, and the district of Una, where these six uh, plants are uh, running. Oh, well, now five of six are running. So, uh, Ceteris Paribus, as they used to say in Latin language, so without uh, just under the same circumstances and without doing any uh, effort, there would be a significant loss of jobs and also reduction in economic output. Something needs to be done. So please, the next slide. What is concretely, not only planned actually, but already running, what is, uh, what is done uh, uh, to uh, face this challenge? There is a quite big uh, program, which is uh, run by their federal government of Germany, but uh, the, resor the resources are distributed then by their uh, government of the federal state of Nofra Westphalia. It's, uh, and this is their five arrows program uh, 
the core topic of uh, my presentation here. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a program about uh, 662 million euros, uh, which are supposed to, to help structurally transforming the economy of the region. 563 of them are for investment projects and 99 million are for non-investment projects. And as you can see, they are supposed to be gradually uh, invested uh, between 2021 and 2038. Uh, the projects are selected uh, by a committee which consists of regional stakeholders. Uh, sorry, um, not sorry, but the, sorry, the committee. The committee recommends actually the the projects to the government, and then the state government uh, has to define, has to choose uh, which projects finally receive the funding. And what is our role in all this process? Uh, Business Metropole Rural, our organization, uh, is uh, responsible for organizing this uh, whole process. So the next slide, please. Um, well, actually, this is a very uh, a very big task and um, a, a big challenge for the region as a whole because it's uh, how do you how do you select the project the projects which projects are good enough uh, this is really not trivial at all. So first of all, the regional action plan was uh, developed uh, together with a set of indicators uh, to have a framework for the projects to be then to be worked out, elaborated, to be to be developed. The projects, uh, generally spoken, they have to uh, fulfill two things. They have to uh, exhibit employment effects because we were saying there it is about compensate. The, the program needs to compensate for job losses. It's not, but it's not only about the number of jobs, but it's also about the quality of jobs, and uh, it is about value creation effects of course so uh, the, the income that the program generates and uh, to what extent it, it facilitates it enables create emergence of uh, startups the projects have to be innovative they cannot be projects like something that anything like uh, that has already been done in the past they have to have an innovative character and they are also supposed to be model-like, something that you can uh, later, let's say, learn from or use as sort of a good practice, bad practice, what, whatever you may call it. And of course, uh, they also need to uh, uh, have a certain sustainability in economic, social, and ecological terms. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, it is not about any type of projects, but there, as I was saying, there's a framework and part of this framework is also to have certain fields of action. There is a total number of five fields of action where these projects are supposed or are, will, or will be uh, implemented. The five uh, fields are energy and climate protection, but important, integrated into the economy. Uh, then the second one is sustainable and strategic land or area development. A very important topic for our region because precisely as I was uh, saying, because of the industrial past of our region, uh, still many polluted areas uh, because of coal mining and so on. Uh, the next one is development of the innovation system. Uh, then the multimodal and new mobility, and uh, finally education, <coughs> pardon, education value chain. So this is, these are the five fields of action. And if we go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, here, just um, some examples. Of course, we cannot go uh, into details now. It would take too much time, but we can talk later about it. Uh, just for you to get a bit more concrete idea of uh, what are these projects, how could they look like? These are examples of projects that have already been uh, officially recommended by the regional committee to the state government to be selected. Uh, 
Uh, so some one, for example, uh, one of them is uh, Center for Applied uh, Artificial Intelligence in Duisburg, uh, which is sup supposed to uh, support uh, creation of startups in this field. Uh, uh, the Hydrogen Alliance with Failure is a, a network of uh, institutions and companies in the eastern part of uh, the, re the Westphalia region. Uh, it, and it is also supposed to uh, uh, support a creation of uh, star startups in the hydrogen area, um, or for example, the materials forum of the future <laughs> about the, the use of materials, concretely the use of plastic. So if, if you, as you can see, there are very different projects dealing with uh, different topics, but they all have to, every project has to say, we are, uh, fitting in the topic or in the field number one or in the number two and so on. One of these five, those um, areas. So, uh, or fields of action. The next slide, please. And this is uh, the final slide actually now to finalize for the moment. Of course, I uh, want to refer to what our organization, our company, Business Metropolitan Rural is doing in for this project, which is uh, a uh, really a huge uh, task. Uh, I think currently there are four or five uh, uh, colleagues of mine working in this project, and what the, what they are doing is they are coordinating the whole process uh, of uh, this uh, project uh, or the idea preparation, project development. So. First of all, it's a central point for, of, for contact for all the stakeholders. Doesn't matter which kind of stakeholders here, this is the central uh, office. Uh, and there is, a, of course, a lot of administrative work. But besides the administrative work, the, a very important part of the work is to is the cons consulting of applicant, applicants and project. As I was saying, this is the biggest task, of course, how to develop uh, these project ideas then to develop them into projects and to prepare them for implementation so that re they really fit into this uh, funding scheme and uh, create a value a new value for for our region so supporting the creation of idea project ideas supporting the project sketches assistance all in the application uh, which means very many different questions of course from those who are preparing uh, the sketches and also provision of external expertise, especially on economic effects and legal matters. Not so, it's not something that we can completely do by our own, but where we then organize the consultancy by uh, third parties. So this is uh, basically our role in this um, in this uh, program or project. And yeah, thank you very much so far, and happy to receive your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. Um, well, I mean, maybe I, I didn't uh, ask, tell you that we have a chat function in Zoom. You can always ask questions during the presentations and I will pick them up. But maybe some people have some questions now to Dimitri. You can just raise your hand or ask the question. I don't see any questions right now. All right, so, Dimitri, maybe I can ask you something myself. Uh, you presented now how this case of uh, what you're doing with making the, your own area more sustainable and innovative. What do you expect by bringing this in if you think about the scale of the Euro Delta? Do you have any ideas about this? How this relates? How? I, I didn't uh, hear the first part. How, so how would that relate? The cases that you brought, the very nice work that you're doing to transform your own area to make it more sustainable and innovative and future-proof. Is this a, a, a manner that you could imagine you could work on also on the scale of the Euro data? Yes, yes, sure. I mean, uh, I, um, I guess there are, uh, there are for the, pro I mean, for the projects themselves, I think there is a, Potential for, uh, of course, for a lot of investment from uh, 
let's say uh, also tran different parts uh, or uh, trans or some transnational uh, projects can be certainly or will be implemented there and for us concretely as uh, econ economic development uh, agencies as urban planners i think we can really learn a lot uh, i i'm not sure if we can is it because of course it is very much linked to a specific regional or local context uh, you know, when we when it get, gets to concrete terms but uh, if we look at the projects that are planned or are being developed there well not yet developed but are planned to be developed i think this is something that uh, is certainly also very interesting uh, and could be valuable to look upon also from other parts of the euro delta region uh, so uh, we because we are all talking about uh, hydrogen we are all talking <clears throat> about uh, circular economy right uh, and some other topics and uh, I, I guess there will be a, a, a good potential let's say for 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 learning from each other about these projects how the how you create uh, such a new projects in the area and not maybe necessarily only in re regions uh, that are in, that are part of structural change or they are fighting them, themselves in the structural change like us but also maybe other regions where these topics like hydrogen or uh, artificial intelligence maybe are not uh, yet uh, that much advanced but have to uh, are, are supposed to play an important role in the next years i guess uh, this is where we can uh, share our knowledge on this on the on these projects initiatives uh, where i hope we can also visit each other uh, hopefully uh, maybe soon if the pandemic is not so uh, so dominant anymore so uh, i i hope we can we can do things about it with with so many exciting projects emerging here now in the region or not now but in the next years of course we're, we're talking about long term medium and uh, long term processes yeah, thank you, Dimitri. This is also a little bit a question that Peter Paul from the city of Den Haag asks. He asks you, um, what do you think that the cooperation of the Eurodata can contribute to your program? I think you partly answered that question. Peter, is this is enough of an answer or do you have, would like to specify it a little bit more? Peter? Yeah, Dagmar. Hello. I realize that you almost stated the same question. So uh, I think it, it was uh, already answered by, by Dimitri. Thank you for this. Uh, but maybe the, the question of, of Hank Bauman is also a good one, but the energy uh, question. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Peter. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, Hank is totally right. Uh, this is a very difficult question now uh, because of the, of the war and the current situation. and. Uh, even uh, as far as I know, um, also the ambitions of the Green Party uh, are not so clear now anymore uh, after the things that happened in recent months and weeks, uh, because of course they are clearly uh, aiming at uh, uh, shutting down their uh, their the coal run, uh, run coal the coal run plants much earlier. Uh, but uh, the question is if it's, re it's really feasible. I guess nobody knows, well, maybe some energy experts, I, but uh, it will be certainly a very difficult task for, for Germany now and also for our region in the next months and years to, to um, so we, we, need, we, need to, we need to advance this process of uh, uh, using uh, renewable energy. This is the only solution, I guess long-term yeah. yeah yeah i guess the uh, the sort of question from hank was the first question that ray came in the mind of everybody when you started presenting is are we still having the same goals like uh, three maybe, months ago can i maybe add something to that yeah um because i think thank you for your answer dimitri um but as far as i know germany is quite advanced uh, in, in certain regions at least also in the hydrogen uh, uh issue and um Let's say that's of course th that might be an interesting thing to to further develop. I, I don't know exactly the situation in the Netherlands. I know there is an exchange with France actually right now, run by our, our former president Nicolas Schelling, uh, between Luxembourg, France, and Germany on on let's say getting to know better what what the hydrogen issue uh, is about, uh, how we can use it. Let's say also how we can develop let's say cross border projects. I can imagine especially for this uh, for this Euro Delta region, 
a sort of wider region, this could be something that that maybe needs to be accelerated. Let's say the exchange of knowledge on that, uh, and maybe also, uh, yeah, let's say the, you, let's say your area, your region, as a sort of energy provider for the region. I mean, I, I can imagine those kind of <coughs> ideas to further develop uh, now. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think you can just uh, maybe one sentence. I mean, hi hydrogen is currently really the topic number one here in the, in this region, and I think it will be also the next years. And we last year there was a study uh, that uh, certified us to be the number one region in Germany in, in terms of hydrogen. Oh, of course, it's also you know such rankings. You can also discuss about them, but uh, who is number one? Who is number two? But I think that's not. Uh, the, the matter, but uh, certainly we are very strong in hydrogen and also our organization, it's, I think it's worth mentioning, Business Metropole Ruhr is just starting now a, um, an office uh, with uh, two employees who will be working only on the topic of hydrogen for, for the next year. So, and I think this is a topic that will be really worth uh, discussing also in the, in the, in the metrics, maybe in one of the metrics forum, uh, Hank and uh, no, well, in Shuyo or Delta, but maybe also the bigger scale in the metrics, because I think many regions are working on this now, and I am sure there will be a lot uh, to share and to discuss, and maybe to see how we can uh, have some projects in common. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri. I start. I see that now the chat to really start. Oh, Eric, can you turn off the can you mute yourself, please? Okay, I see that now the chat really starts uh, working, um, but I would like to do work on my time management and we can pick up the questions uh, maybe later in the discussion. Yes, and we also have one question here. Also answer them in the chat as well, um, while we start with our second presentation of today. Is, uh, I have the feeling that something is not going right here right now. Um, Please, can I ask the second speech, speaker, Daniel, sure. to start the presentation? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us to tell a little bit uh, more about the Urban Development Initiative in the Brainport Eindhoven region. I will start sharing my slides. Uh, let me check if this, if this works. Um, yeah, maybe uh, I can start by uh, telling a little bit about our region, uh, which is the Brainport Eindhoven region, one of the three main ports of the Netherlands, uh, next to Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Uh, the Eindhoven region is one of the pillars be, uh, beneath the Dutch economy, especially for the, the presence of a lot of high tech. Uh, and uh, uh, companies and a lot of uh, R&D activities in the region, um, but also for the fact that uh, there is a hip's history of cooperation between academia, uh, industry and government in our region, which has been uh, proven successful in the past on, on several areas. Uh, and we're trying to do this again, and then in the field of urban planning. Um, and the reason for that is because in the past, it was mostly uh, industry driven, these kind of corporations. But uh, what we see is that the cities are facing huge challenges in, uh, in their urban planning. Uh, we have to uh, um, add a lot of housing to our cities, uh, especially within the city centers, uh, which uh, um, altogether brings a lot of challenges in the field of mobility, in the field of energy, in the field of uh, uh, social challenges like social divide or uh, livability and, uh, and also um, the um, welfare situation. So um, we're, we, we really realize that we cannot solve these challenges by ourselves. You cannot solve them separately. It's, it's uh, ask for integrated solutions and uh, and we also see that this cannot be done in a traditional way any, any, anymore. There we, we need a new way of cooperation with the uh, urban development ecosystem. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, digitization and data can help us to overcome the challenges that we have. 
Um, therefore, we uh, restarted the Urban Development Initiative, um, and its aim is to accelerate uh, urban solutions in the Brainport Eindhoven region uh, through multi helix innovation in ecosystems. That's what we do. Um, and we have several programs running within the UDI, uh, the Urban Development Initiative uh, on energy transition, on future-proof housing and uh, uh, building, which is also uh, um, um, connected to building industry 4.0 and the uh, Bauhaus Initiative, of course. Uh, and we have the Digital City Program. And uh, I was asked to tell you a little bit more about this program, which we uh, recently started. And uh, we are currently, currently uh, uh, well, um, running this program. Um, maybe I can tell you a little bit more about the Urban Development Initiative, because it was founded by uh, five organizations, uh, the cities of Eindhoven and Helmond, with, uh, of course, the, the demanding side. We, we have the problems, and we would like to invite academia, um, industry, but also all kinds of social institutions, like housing corporations, and eventually also the citizens themselves to, to uh, help us out solving these big challenges. So uh, one of the other partners is the University of Eindhoven, the Technical University of Eindhoven, but also the German Fraunhofer Institute, uh, especially Fraunhofer EAO, Stuttgart based, is involved in this. And together we founded the Urban Development Initiative. But around these innovation programs, we also start um, innovation ecosystems or innovation partnerships that uh, have many partners from industry knowledge institutes and uh, uh, other organizations to uh, work on these challenges. Um, the digital city program I will focus now on is um, looking at, at urban planning, urban development, uh, because we, what we see is that these big uh, societal challenges of today uh, all come together in area development, and uh, especially uh, the complexity uh, is, is growing every time, so we need a new way of working, and um, I have a short movie that, uh, that tells a little bit of how we are planning this. Uh, I hope the, the movie will work and uh, I will ask Alan Krita to back me up if it doesn't work. Uh, but what we are looking is for new digital solutions uh, for integrated and sustainable city planning. Um, and the purpose is to, to uh, have more evidence-based decision making, but also to uh, better involve our citizens in the decision making. So, and we think, especially digital twinning, and other digital tools can help us uh, by doing this. So, um, but, but the essence is that we want to have a new way of working with the uh, urban development ecosystem. So that also includes uh, all kinds of disciplines within our own organizations, but also uh, uh, development companies, uh, engineering companies, uh, architects, uh, all parties that are involved in the urban development process. Um, I will try to start up the, the movie and I hope you can hear the sound. If not, please uh, let me know, then, uh, then I will uh, ask uh, Anakrita to help me out. Daniel, we cannot see or hear anything from no. the movie. Can you please help me yes. out then? Yes, I'm quickly sharing my screen. You have to unshare. Yes. I hope this works. Can everyone see? Yes. Yeah. The current trend of urbanization predicts that by 2050, over 70% of the world's population will live in cities. Urban environments are diverse, complex and constantly evolving. Many people and organizations are involved with a lot of interdependencies. Domains like housing, mobility and energy are working too independently, making it extremely difficult to build a city collaboratively. We need a new way of working, a digital way. 
the digital revolution will fundamentally reshape the way we plan, design, build, research and govern cities. At the heart of this transition will be urban digital twinning, creating digital versions of the city that visualizes the high level of complexity and many interdependencies in a tangible way. It supports evidence-based decision-making and empowering citizens. It can be used to build different scenarios for future plans. This will greatly improve collaboration and results. However, these kinds of digital twins can only be developed by a joint effort of our entire ecosystem of city planning. That's why the UDI Digital City Programme gathered our ecosystem to continuously work on an innovation method how to develop, test, validate and scale digital twin solutions. We research the innovation challenges, we use the results to improve the method and we test and validate the method by the use cases. This leads to proven solutions that can be scaled globally. The transition to digital is essential to solve the complex puzzle of future-proof city planning. We believe cities should take the first step and we invite you and the entire ecosystem to join us on this journey. Okay, I will try to pick up the presentation again. Can you all see it? Yes. Great. No, that worked out. Thank you uh, for helping me out, uh, Alan Krita. No problem, Daniel. Um, so what we, what we did is uh, we were convinced we cannot do this by ourselves. We need an innovation partnership. And of course, it should be beneficiary for all partners involved. So um, the idea is that all partners strengthen their own R&D portfolio by cooperation. Um, by working together, we can develop standards and, uh, and also game rules uh, to, to work on this. Uh, we are uh, providing the city as living labs to, to test and validate uh, the, the technologies and the methods that we, uh, we come uh, uh, to develop together. Uh, and um, of course, uh, also we are uh, not thinking that we can do this in, in one region. If you want to set new standards and new ways of working, you have to work together with other partners. And we do that on a national level and also a European level. So we're providing our ecosystem partners also access to these networks. Um, but these are the partners that we are currently working with um, and through different sessions, uh, co-creation sessions, we came to a program that, uh, as mentioned before, is, is focusing around an innovation method. Uh, we have several innovation challenges defined uh, with the partners and we use the, the city's uh, large area development projects to, to test and validate things. But on the same time, uh, we, we do that on different levels. Sometimes the situation asks for, well, uh, uh, almost uh, directly applicable solutions. So then we are in the higher technology level, uh, readiness levels. Uh, but, but sometimes we want to work uh, on next level use cases, what we, what we call them, is to, to work on a more, uh, well, a lab uh, oriented situation. And, and then we can look at new solutions that are not uh, completely proven yet. Um, in the end, of course, we want to share what we have found out with the world to, to, make, uh, to help other people out as well. Um, so uh, we, we are uh, working on different levels within the program. We have different application areas, of course. Uh, one partner is more comfortable with a certain uh, application area than, than others. We have these innovation challenges and we have the use cases. Um, these uh, are some of the application areas. So it's about densification, it's about mobility, it's about climate and energy, and it's about livability uh, and also um, uh, um, welfare of people. Um, and in the end, what we need is an integrated systemic urban design and planning to, all, to bring this all to, together. So that's the, the areas that we work in. Um, we have different innovation challenges and the heart is, is uh, 
is uh, of course um, the, the data and anal an analytics and visualization, but therefore you need digital infrastructure uh, where we believe that we should separate data and uh, applications. Uh, so we need urban platforms to do deal with this. Um, and also very important is to have integrated impact assessment frameworks and uh, the universities involved are, are working on those because you want to have objective uh, indicators to, to measure certain things in the cities. But uh, uh, to really have impact, of course, these indicators should be used by as many parties as, as possible. So um, the idea is to, to translate our ambitions in, in com concrete targets, but also in clear indicators. Um, which is very, uh, one thing is very important, of course, uh, we, we have to face that we are uh, helping our different users. Uh, we have the people from the city themselves in different departments. We have the, the partners in the, in the urban development ecosystem, but we also have citizens, uh, politicians, uh, city boards, and all they need, uh, uh, and they all need uh, the, the information presented in a certain way. And what, what we, uh, as a design region, uh, we also think it's very important to have uh, user-focused design. And uh, so this is an important part. And of course, working in, a, in an urban context uh, with a strongly uh, involved governmental role, it's also very important to, to, uh, to comply with law and ethics uh, in everything that we, what we do. We, we're using algorithms to, to predict, uh, to create scenarios, um, and we don't want to have the check on if it's uh, ethical or compliant to, to law and, uh, and privacy uh, uh, legislation and things. In the end, we want to have that from the very beginning. So we'll be bringing that to the front of the development process and try to develop privacy by design, privacy of ethics by design solutions. That's, that's one of the challenge. So these are... Uh, things that we discuss with the ecosystem partners and try to solve and come up with their own with our own game rules that we want to, to uh, share and, 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 and agree upon. Um, and yeah, then there is, of course, uh, you, you have your technical roadmaps, you have your roadmaps on the uh, integrated assessment frameworks. Um, uh, to bring uh, things further, uh, um, what we what we are doing on the, on the one side is, is we have we set a north star, um, and in this area it's more on uh, a lower TRL levels. We are uh, uh, developing things, but at the same time we need well pretty uh, uh, rapid applicable solutions as well. So that's that's the challenge to deal with that. Um, same goes for the infrastructure and, uh, and the, the, the technical situation. So we, we start with static data, you, you come up with the dynamic data, and more and more we are developing into uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence to, to, to create the scenarios and predictive uh, uh, scenarios that, that we need. About the use cases, well, uh, actually at the moment, uh, Eindhoven is, is developing its city centers. They are adding 15,000 15, houses to the city center between now and 2040. So there is a huge playing ground uh, where uh, all kinds of uh, uh, challenges are dealt with. Uh, so it's, it's not only about housing, it's also about keeping the city accessible, to make sure that it's climate adaptive and resilient. And, and also uh, the, the city has to make uh, an energy transition. So that's, that's quite a complex challenge that fits perfectly for these uh, challenges that we are facing. Um, you know, on a little bit smaller scale, same things happen in Helmond, but Helmond also has a unique development which is called Brainport Smart District, which is a greenfield location where we are developing a new uh, housing uh, district with 1,500 houses. And uh, well, where there we can uh, create a smart district from, from scratch. And that also uh, uh, offers huge possibilities to, to, to bring in new solutions. And in the end, the ultimate goal is to have the 
the ultimate game room where all partners involved in the development process can meet each other, find each other, and discuss on evidence-based uh, 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 data uh, uh, generated information and then come to better decisions. Uh, and uh, we also want to have the, great, the ultimate benchmark because we want to know that, that the, the indicators that we use are uh, valuable and also generally accepted. Uh, and of course, uh, we all do this for the for the for the public. Uh, so it's also about co-creation and how to involve citizens in uh, very strategic phases of uh, urban uh, development. Uh, and that's well what we uh, assigned ourselves. So but then we have to make uh, the the complex information also accessible. And we think that digitization can also help out with that. Therefore, we also look like uh, look at things like uh, AR and VR uh, to help them out. So that's what we, uh, in a nutshell, what we are trying to do in the in the urban development initiative. Uh, we're also involved in, in several European projects already. Uh, we are part of the proposal of the Dutch uh, European D uh, Digital Innovation Hub for the public sector. So. Uh, yeah, it's important to reach out and uh, I'm happy to, to be able to reach out to you today as well. So thank you very much for your intention and uh, for, in, for your interest and uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, Daniel, thank you very much. What a uh, complete and ambitious project you're working on. As a urban planner, this is really very interesting. Um, I saw a couple of questions, but I'm also a little bit doubting whether we should really go into it right now, because we also have a third presentation and we're really running out of time. So I would like now the next presentation, Ernst von Seil von Sveko to present, and then there were a couple of uh, questions that I think are relevant for all three of you, so can, maybe we can have a discussion. Perfectly fine by me. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Ernst. Ernst, we cannot hear you. Okay. So, yes, it works. Ernst, you're still on mute. Um. And maybe you should stop sharing. Yeah, yeah now we hear you. Yeah. I will stop sharing because I saw something wrong, just a part of it. Um, there's something going on wrong on my side. Everything was checked, but now I have something. Oh, I forget the basics. That one I should have. I'm sorry, looked at the wrong one. So now you can see my presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for the invitation and for the uh, little trouble at the beginning. Um, the title of my presentation is Asset Management and Tooling and the Material Passport. Uh, my name is Ernst van Zuiden. I'm project manager at Sweco in the Netherlands. And I would like to take you on a small journey into the world of asset management uh, of public space management. For more than 25 years, uh, ago, we had already an asset management tool, and in 2012, we developed it. And to give you an, a kind of focus of what we've done, I would like to show a small promo movie we made at that moment, and uh, some figures which are mentioned in this promo are based on the, uh, the state of 12, uh, 2012, so that is a bit different than uh, you should should see now. And why do I yeah. our world crowded with people who exist, live and work. This is observe your tool for managing you cannot see the can't field. See anything, eh? the city we move preferably as there early as possible and as fast as possible from home to I will just start all over again. This was not the kind of presentation I had 
in mind. Um, I'm not sure, Alakita, do you have to show them as well? Maybe you could show it that work with Dimitri. No, the, it will it will come. Now you can see something? No. No. That's my Ernst, maybe you can, uh, uh, I can share yeah. just the video and then you can share the presentation when you're speaking. Yeah, yeah, per perfect. Please do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have the video link for me? Because I don't see it. In it, the it is in the present. No, it's it's uh, mentioned on the on my presentation. Itself. Well, I will skip uh, that uh, that one. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter that much, but I do. I'm not used to work with uh, with Zoom, so apologies for that. Uh, then I will take this one, share this one. So now you can see. Well, when you look, sorry, uh, when you look at asset management, that that's a balance between performance, cost, and risk. When you look at the cost, the capital loss must be under control, because what we see on our assets is that we want to do some maintenance and that will be done in a kind uh, in a period uh, where we have an, uh, the, the maintenance of, of the assets. For example, the road, it is uh, put down and the, the, the year to use it is about 40 years, uh, the, the durance to use it. But to keep that uh, performance all, all right, we have to inspect it and we uh, do the maintenance on it. But when we don't have much money to do the maintenance directly, we will put it to another period and uh, then it will be more costly. And for that point, the money you have to put extra in it, we see as capital loss. Of course, we want to see the, uh, the information of the, uh, of the risk. We would also would like to have it in, 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 in our point of view. Um, and everything must be sustainable. Is it safe? Is it clear? And that is what we have to discuss in former and when we start at the asset management. For the performance, it's always required that the maintenance are to a great level. Uh, we have in the Netherlands a certain kind of scaling from A plus until D, where A plus is very superb and uh, the D level is uh, almost, uh, yeah, total loss of everything. So there is a big difference in it. All that has been done uh, by the policy and the strategy, uh, and that is put in the rows of, 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 uh, of asset management. It's, it's a Dutch uh, um, rows where we uh, have the whole scope of asset management in, in provided. For example, a municipality who is, uh, has a kind of policy and strategy, but it's based on a vision. We, for example, as a, as a municipality would like, uh, we want it to be the greenest uh, municipality or we want the most safe municipality. All that will be brought back to the policy and strategy. From that point of view, you are going over to the managing and the programming. What are we going to do? What do we have to do? And then you can plan and prepare that. When you have planned and prepared that you are building it and you have to maintain it. When it is maintained and built, you look, is everything going all right? You're showing your monitoring, you are analyzing the whole process. Is everything still okay? And if it isn't, or it is, then you can evaluate it and adjust your strategy and all your program. And that all together is in the rows of asset management, but there are always two very important issues. And one is then the people in the organization. Are the people uh, committed to it? Uh, do they have the right skills? But also, do we have the right data? And do we, can we manage the, the information from it? And that, all together, we put in our uh, management as a tool calling Observe. Observe is just a name, so it's not observing for looking at something. It's just a, a, a product name. In that application, we have several it, it's, uh, um, uh, modules, one for greening, civil constructions, roads, sewer, traffic li uh, lightning, cable and, and tubes, other objects like uh, banks in, in the city, uh, garbage uh, bins, uh, traffic signs, 
for playgrounds and also for traffic systems. All those are together to an integral asset management system. All the information is recording to a map. So all the information is uh, localized on the map in, in, with a certain accuracy. And therefore there's a lot of information to it. For example, here you have a light pole where there is, is, is also the, the extent, the lamps, uh, and all the information is which we require for a purpose goal is, uh, is put into the system. When we have a system, you have also some exchange and we have to maintain it. So we want to do it with all kinds of devices in the field and we make just connection and we're working directly in the application. But we also can extract the data for reporting using in, 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 in KISS tools or in CAT systems, or we can use in web services. Further on, we're using other uh, information for external applications. We can use also area photos. So we have more uh, knowledge about the, the, the surroundings we are working with. We can exchange by, by AP uh, new technology. We are using FME, which is a very strong ELT uh, programming tool. Uh, we are using Tableau, which has a very strong uh, map co uh, component. And we are also connecting, for example, where we can use the, the, uh, the notifications of public space. So the citizen can already put on the map on the particular key objects. He can uh, give some comments on it. The, the lighting is not, or there is graffiti on, on the walls. And so the maintenance can uh, put all that information together and maintain the, all the objects within their own municipality. Based on all that information, we have already the information when I'm going to the material passport because I know from a bank or I know from the traffic uh, road or I know from, from the green, from the tree, what kind of tree it is, what kind of material the lamppost is made, uh, what kind of material is the surface of the road. But the material passport is just a level beyond. And uh, with that, we want to know how is the general material built on? What kind of substances are in it? Now we know a lot of the substances which are, we are using, but we can't reuse them or we won't reuse them because it's uh, damaging our health or uh, we don't want to have it in our env environment. And with that, we had made a pilot with three municipalities, uh, Rotterdam, Tilburg and Zwolle. And there we made uh, the, 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 the material passport as you see here. We based it on three assets, roads, green, civil constructions and sewering. And we are using therefore also the guidelines. We have in the Netherlands several standards and for the circular building, we have an, uh, a guiding line calling CB23 and that's a Dutch circular building guide. What was, uh, when we are building the material passport, we did it with some uh, maintenance uh, asset managers and uh, we asked them, which information do you need for your circularity? Well, the most of the information they said was just the inventory, which I already can see on the outside. But I want to know what material is it built on. So for example, the, 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 uh, the components in, in asphalt, there are uh, certain materials in which I don't want to know. I know how much is in it. And all that information we can put in a material passport. In the Netherlands, we already, there is already some existence of material passport, but it is mostly made for buildings. So the total uh, construction of the building is a material passport, so we know about the walls, what material is in it. But for the infrastructure, it wasn't that big or also available. So that is why we put on this uh, material pilot passport. What are we putting into a material passport? Here you can see the most of the general material in what surface is it laid. Of course, the road is built on several layers. Um, uh, what is the guarantee? With that information, we do it like a kind of needle. We stick it into the, to the materials. We get all that information to the point of view, and then we attach the material on the materials and including all kinds of documents, which we need for proving it because the material passport isn't made for the past, it's made for the future. 
because when the road is put down or the, the sewer is put down, the, the, the life uh, endurance is 40, 60 years. So what information do we need about 20, 40, 60 years for reusing or recycling? What information do we need? And that is what we put in the material passport. Because what we want to know, and here you see a dashboard, that we can make a selection of a kind of area. It could be the whole municipality, but it can also be a road or a region. And we want to know of that asset, what material do we have? And here you can see all kinds of materials which were in it, so concrete, wood, uh, artificial, thing, other materials, uh, steel, iron, and what kind of, where did it come from? Is it from reuse? Is it from recycling? Or is it just a perennial material? And in the middle, you see the activities. And the activities that, for example, on the bridge, we are um, replacing uh, the, 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 the bars. Uh, are we just doing uh, civil technical uh, maintenance? What material is coming out? So what do we have in? And what, do we, what is coming out? And how do we want to use it? Does something stay behind or do we can use it for energy reuse, for just reusing or recycling, or do we just put it to, uh, to, to the graveyard? So that is all kind of information we want to know. So our, when we are redeveloping a city, uh, an area or whatever, then I can see already what kind of material do we have. And this information we can also put on a certain marketplace. So that a municipality who isn't using some using, but he wants to use uh, reused material, that he can already collect some of that material from the uh, material marketplace. Um, excuse me, Ant. I'm yeah. looking a little bit at the time, and you, I saw that you still have a lot of slides. Could you uh, trying to wrap up a little bit? Please? Yeah, of course, no problem. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, examples we have on on. Uh, on the material passport, it's just uh, the uh, municipality of Swollen, they had a lot of trees with, which were ill and that material they could use for in the city. But they said the wood from the city wood should stay in. And what they, what they have done is uh, uh, use the wood by a housing corporate company for the facade renovation of their, of, of their buildings. And the night edition of this story is that the Processing was well done through people with the distance to the labor market. So this was immediately became a kind of social return project. And for this indicator was needed the sustainability of the wood. And from that, uh, you just can get from the information you have, you can make a dashboard and then you know what kind of material on the certain uh, sustainability you have. Very important is, what information do you need and what does the municipality, for example, have? Do they have a gap of data? What is the barrier to get the information and how can we uh, provide them with a solution? And that all together uh, was used on the material passport also in this pilot. You want more information about Observe? You can look at two sites, the English version and the Dutch version. And if you have any other information you want to require, uh, please contact me. Thank you for your uh, time. Thank you, Anne. Would you stop sharing, please? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Well, that was, uh, again, a very different project. I thought today we saw very, three very different approaches about how cities or companies are trying to um, enhance the way of our lives. We saw uh, Dimitri, I'm not sure Dimitri, are you still in here for, for the discussion? Yes, yeah, I'm okay, okay, joining you for another computer. Okay, uh, so Dimitri, you showed us a way how you are changing really a big transformation. There's an echo. And a big economic transformation of the Ruhr Delta by uh, having funding for new projects. Um, afterwards, we saw an example about how we want to make a very smart to develop a different tools to make new way of making building cities. And Ernst, you showed us a way how we can really uh, prove, look at it, it's different tools. 
I think it's an interesting question. A couple of, I saw this chat and there are so many different interesting questions. I think one of the things what I thought was very interesting was also what Eric Kasper was stating, that you see that the transformation of the raw data has effect directly to the Euro Delta. Um, what happens there affects the harbors of different areas. So this is something very interesting to see. I think that what Daniel was showing us this new tool, a smart tool, and also what Ernst is showing, this new way of using digitalization to come up with new methods to change the way we're building or how we're using material is very interesting. But then the question of Cecilia rises um, immediately. What you presented all these things, what would you like the next generation to work on? Or what are your ideas? Um, maybe Cecilia, you want to ask the question yourself. Oh, you just did. <laughs> no, but what I'm what I'm trying to highlight or basically ask from all three approaches is how would you actively involve the next generation? Because this is our audience today, and I really want to you know, speak to our audience also, and not only, of course, we have practitioners in the room as well, but I think it's important to know how can you, not just on a research base, but, but also practically, that's something I missed in my academic life as well, that my research and my experiences, practical internships, anything that you do along the way while you study and while you start working, how can you contribute to this initiative? On the one hand, for instance, in the urban initiative, in the brain port, because Brainport Eindhoven is already very, very interconnected with the university as far as I'm concerned. But how is it with Metropole Ruhr and the five aerial plan? Very concretely, how can students uh, with specialities in these fields also in study programs, how can they be in the long term structurally be involved in such a, such a setting up of such a program? Yeah, thank you, Cecilia. Uh, maybe Dimitri, you want to ask that one? Yes, of course, it's a very good question. Thank you, Cecilia. And I think there will be a, a, lot, a lot of room uh, for involving uh, young researchers or young professionals, but also students, because uh, some of the projects already and many or more of those to come are supposed to have a strong involvement of universities. So uh, that's why I, I hope there will be also possibilities for yeah, students, young researchers, and so on to uh, to participate or maybe co-develop even co -develop this uh, um, those projects. So, Dagmar, uh, is it okay if I add something to this Cecilia's point? Of course, um, Alan Peter. So I think uh, probably this is for all the participants because from tomorrow we will be working on the work in this workshop and this is one of the themes that we are addressing so to all the participants but also at the same time uh, the participants who will be specially working on this subject it's really i think interesting what Dagmar you mentioned that the three sides of special uh, special uh, uh, strategies that we looked into uh, what kind of specializations do we need what different spatial impact can it uh, bring to the mega region to a local scale, but also at the same time involvement of stakeholders. So I would just like to point out one quick thing for all the participants. You can always bring in uh, ideas to these sort of initiatives and I think you can always reach out to these uh, panelists or uh, the organizations with your innovative ideas because what we are expecting from the next generation is the innovation or the out of the box thinking and that's something you can always bring it in but also at the same time get inspired by how their the data and the information is being used how it is affecting the historical process or the chron chronological process of spatial development in local areas with these strategies and uh, what kind of stakeholder involvement is happening so these are the three points for me from each uh, presentations that is very interesting and very supportive to what we are trying to tell a story about long term development so thank you everyone for the presentations welcome thank you very much welcome. you're welcome Thank you, Alan Kita. It almost sounded like you final we're finalizing. Uh, <laughs> actually, but I, I would like to have also some younger people. Uh, I, very briefly, Dagmar, actually three of uh, four or five people are working at our office on the uh, project that I presented are people just directly coming from the university. 
So it also has already had some very direct involvement of uh, very young professionals <laughs> in, the, in, this, in this program who can directly apply their knowledge uh, here in practice. Maybe somebody in your office would like to say something. We had actually, we had also a question. Uh, um, yes. Hi. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Hi, I am uh, Sayed Lishan from uh, Abitya. And uh, I uh, happen to have a question for Dimitri actually. And uh, my question was like, uh, when uh, when uh, in the uh, in the presentation they were talking about the tri modal approach and innovative technology being used in the project so that kind of approaches are actually based on the specific region or are they applied in such a way that they become a pilot project and then can be replicated in various parts of the euro delta to integrate it better that's the question which I... Yeah, as far uh, Rebecca, you can correct me. I think the model character mainly refers to the region, to our region itself. Uh, yes. But... Yeah, but then of course, it will be very interesting to see uh, then in the next years if they if uh, that model character would be also relevant for other parts of the Euro Delta region or for other European regions. I think that's not something that they really have and uh, so explicitly on the on the agenda but that could become a very yeah, i mean i always feel it's thing. something that can be taken up with the various parts of euro delta and yeah. applied that would be great because most of the problem that euro delta is facing is pretty much same but different in terms of their uh, individual context but on a larger scale they're same so basically it's something that can be a pilot project and then we can test that in if it's successful, mm -hmm. that can be applied to various parts of the mm -hmm. Euro Delta in order to, you know, achieve that broader connection, which actually Euro Delta aims for. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why exactly you are totally right, and that's why I was saying that we should really uh, have exchange on this, and uh, um, as also Peter was saying, uh, establish some uh, corridors in the Euro Delta region to uh, to have these knowledge flows. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the next generation of themselves? <laughs> no, you're waiting for your workshop tomorrow. I saw a question about underground infrastructure and digital twitting. And I can affirm that we're also looking at underground infrastructure because especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, energy transition, uh, we're talking also about heat networks and things like that. Uh, so also the, the uh, putting the underground uh, networks in, into uh, digital twins is very important to have this integrated approach of, of area development. So uh, that's, that's for sure. That's good to hear. Thanks, Daniel. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Alan Krita, you wanted to add some things that you told me before. Yeah, I think uh, the uh, question from Eric is also quite interesting. He has put up in the chat box. I think this is something quite interesting for the students as well. Uh, Eric, can you ask your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to start with for three uh, very interesting presentations. And to, what struck me is that uh, there is some connection between each three of these presentations. That is the great trust and the great emphasis they put on dig digitalization. And I, I agree with that completely. But for instance, in Amsterdam, and I think this is very much uh, similar to other parts of the Euro region. This requires huge investments to start with for digital infrastructure uh, and also for all sort of extra consequences it has. For instance, uh, we try to produce more sustainable energy and then a lot of this sustainable energy goes, electricity goes into these big data centers that require tremendous amounts of energy. So in a way, the expectations that we have that, that digitalization could contribute to sustainability in fact, could also contribute to non-sustainable uh, developments. So I, I think this is this is interesting because 
maybe there's also something on the on a, a of a scale issue. If if we work in in every part of the Euro region separately, every village has its own data center and have its own problem with that. Maybe that is not a solution. Maybe we could come up with some sort of an intelligent uh, strategy for that. Chad. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, Eric. I fully agree. Uh, I think uh, uh, cities many times are thinking they have to do everything by their uh, by themselves. Uh, so the whole idea of, of starting our uh, urban development uh, initiative was also to to replicate replicate good ideas from from others. Um, and maybe I can add to the discussion that in our region, uh, the Brainport region, another very important ecosystem is one working on photonics. And that might be one of the solutions to have more energy efficient data transmission possible in the future. But that's still something for the future, but people are working on that as, as well. Thank you. Yeah. No, I still, maybe maybe one, one more thing uh, to, to add. For instance, I would be interested in the heat that these data centers produce because they, they require a lot of electricity, but then they produce uh, heat as a rest product. And that means that uh, that could be used for city heating, but that means that these uh, data centers have to be very close to urban regions, for instance. So that's just a spatial issue. I would be very interested in in, in uh, challenging ideas of the this next generation colleagues of ours to uh, to come up with tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's very nice. Maybe, um, Alakita, maybe you want to tell us what we're doing tomorrow. Maybe that's a good link. Yes, uh, so um, I think uh, for all the uh, presentators today, I'm not sure if you are joining tomorrow for the opening ceremony or not. So we will be starting tomorrow at nine o'clock with our opening ceremony with keynote speaker uh, from uh, UN SDGs, but also with a lot of connections and links between research academy and practice. So that's what we are uh, starting with tomorrow, but mainly tomorrow and day after it's dedicated for the participants. So the master studios, as well as um, uh, young professionals who will be working together in interdisciplinary teams. So there are 12 teams that has been already developed. I just wanted to quickly check today with the participants who are present today. Uh, if all of you have received everything from our end, if there are any queries about it, you have received what is the project that you will be working on. And uh, if there are any questions, we will be really happy to answer to you. So please feel free to send us an email about it. And uh, I would invite all the practitioners and all the experts here present to join us during the opening ceremony, as well as the closing ceremony on Friday, which is at three o'clock. So that's, uh, that's the next two days plans. And uh, I think uh, your presentations will really contribute a lot in the thinking process and uh, the work of the students. So you can always come back on the closing ceremony and see their presentations alongside. <coughs> so, that would be really great. Uh, Dagmar, I see Peter is there and he wants to add something. Yes, yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alakrita. Uh, just some words about uh, um, our asset program of the Euro Delta, because we are uh, thinking as your Delta partners to, to set up a, a project uh, on um, um, uh, circular economy. And uh, what we are looking for is uh, what are uh, interesting uh, cars, raw materials, which uh, which we can work on in a circular economy in the Euro Delta. So what is, is on this Euro Delta scale, a very relevant raw material to, to work on together. Like for instance, the e-waste, uh, this, this, in, in, in this, quite dynamic period after this, this, this COVID crisis, but also the, the, the war which is happening in, in Ukraine. We are looking at a different way on, on raw materials. Uh, and um, 
this can be also for you as, as the next generation to, to think about what are interesting raw materials to, to work together on this Euro Delta scale, which also has an impact on uh, our urban regions, our cities. So we can collecting uh, waste, e-waste, for instance, or textiles or wood or whatsoever. But uh, what is particularly relevant for this uh, Euro Delta scale to work together? That, that's for us a very relevant question. So maybe you can work on it uh, in the coming days. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Peter. That's a uh, good uh, addition. Um, I, I have one question to Valeria. Uh, you put on in a note, the spatial and environmental dimensions of the platform economy are a key issue. Would you like to clarify this statement? If you're here? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes. And then thanks for uh, paying attention to this statement. Uh, um, the idea was just to highlight, to focus on the fact that uh, the digital economy and the platform economy are changing, of course, and restructuring uh, the way in which we think uh, of productive places uh, on one end, uh, but they have uh, very important uh, environmental impacts and also special impacts because they probably choose places which are not usual ones or they are inventing some places that had some other functions. Uh, I think this is a very uh, challenging uh, question for planners that normally are thinking about uh, the economic base of the city uh, in relation to service uh, and uh, manufacturing while we are uh, having new actors and new economic uh, forms and uh, models that probably are um, impacting on places which we didn't think about or are uh, re renovating. I mean, some places that uh, had a very traditional and settled model of uh, uh, development, spatial development and uh, environmental impact. So maybe from the planning and spatial planning point of view, we should uh, um, develop some models to, to understand how these new things happen in the city uh, in a wider scale, of course, and uh, how planning can help uh, in a certain sense and not just, uh, um, let's say, uh, react passively uh, to these new, new actors and new functions in the city. This was the, the idea, basically. Thank you, Valeria. Um, okay, it is one minute before. I had a question from the organizers. Please put all your cameras on so we can make a screenshot as a memory of today and also for our communication outside. Inspire more people to join us. 